Fawcett. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist. Originally grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, but then moved to New York City after my undergraduate degree and then ultimately to Florida about 25 years ago. So now I live in Wilton Manors, Florida. My specialty in terms of psychotherapy is sex therapy as well as addictions. And I do a lot of work with gay men, and HIV-related mental health and substance abuse disorders, and most recently with methamphetamine, which we're seeing uh, come back in a, in a very big way in the gay community. For me, it was very personal. I was diagnosed in 1988 uh, as positive and uh, lived with it for quite a while. I was already working as a mental health therapist at the time, uh, but not particularly working in any way with gay men or with HIV. And I reoriented my specialty based on my own experience and, and the needs that I was seeing in terms of what gay men living with HIV were experiencing and what they needed in terms of mental health services and substance abuse services. In those years, of course, it was a death sentence. I was I very nearly died myself several times, uh, the most serious with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the, in the early 90s. And then in 96, when the protease inhibitors came out, everything changed. But I was very aware of uh, the experiences, that the stigma, the shame, the lack of services that people were experiencing, and really wanted to make an effort to kind of correct some of those things. And for a long time, because of the stigma, I wasn't out in terms of my own status as well. So I was working uh, in mental health agencies and hospitals without disclosing my own HIV status um, for fear of losing my job and my insurance. I'd met my partner at the time in 1982 in New York, and we moved to Florida together. We were both therapists, and um, we had decided to get tested for HIV in 1988 on a whim, thinking uh, because we were monogamous for five or six years, assuming it was just nothing. And at that time, there were no testing centers. We had a friend of ours who was a physician take our test. We used fake names um, and thought nothing of it. And then about two weeks later, he called with this terrible news that we were both positive and we were stunned. Because of all the fear, the gloomy outlook, we felt we couldn't tell anyone. It so happened that my sister, who with whom I'm very close, was visiting us at the time. We got that telephone call and so she knew right away and I was very grateful for that. Uh, but we I had elderly parents who I was afraid to tell. Uh, my partner at the time had been married before, had children. Uh, we were afraid he wouldn't be able to, his ex-wife wouldn't allow him to see the children. Uh, so there's all these ramifications. We decided to keep it secret and uh, not tell anyone and not do anything about it, which we did for several years until we started to have symptoms. We went on AZT, which was the most common and probably only drug at that time. And I decided to pay for the first round out of pocket because I was afraid to put it on my insurance. Uh, but it was $600 a month and I simply couldn't afford it. Ultimately, put it on my insurance. At that time, PCP pneumonia was very devastating for people, and they discovered that if you inhaled uh, something called pentamidine, uh, it would prevent you from getting PCP. And we went up to an anonymous clinic that offered those services for us for free. We both were doing well after the protease inhibitors, new medications. He developed resistance to all the available medications. And it's something that I think all of us still live in fear of, especially those of us that have been on so many different medications over the years. We both, we were in all kinds of drug trials. The doctor said there was really no more meds that were working for him. It began this very kind of torturous decline um, where he got sicker and sicker. And um, in March of 2004, he passed away. I started working with gay men in my therapy practice 16 years ago, and this was about 2000. And I started seeing a lot of gay men coming in with a lot of sexual dysfunction and a lot of health problems and uh, increasing amounts of drug use. But we started seeing a lot of methamphetamine use. And methamphetamine has come in cycles through the years. It's been a popular drug that gay men use in association with sex. Um, but I started really seeing it getting out of control. And I started talking to my colleagues and no one really had good answers about what was happening. Everyone was seeing it in their offices, but we didn't know quite what to do about it. So I founded the South Florida Methamphetamine Task Force in 2002, and we started bringing together groups of people in the community to, to address the issue. And that was the beginning of this work. I started a not-for-profit group that, that offered free groups and free counseling for people. We offered testing and awareness. 
But about 2006, federal laws changed, methamphetamine was harder to produce, and so it kind of declined. And then about three years ago now, I started seeing it again, almost the same thing. Clients coming in, men that I had been treating who were doing very well, losing 20, 30 pounds, uh, starting to complain of addiction, losing their partners, losing their jobs, and again it was methamphetamine. But this time, the methamphetamine was, was stronger, it was cheaper. When they, they shut down the production in the United States, we started getting industrial quality methamphetamine from Mexico that was brought in um, through the cartels, and it was much more addictive and much more devastating. At that time, a book had been in my mind for about 10 years uh, of what I was doing to treat and how I was successfully helping guys not get past methamphetamine, but, but also reintegrates healthy sexuality and intimacy, because that's one of the things that methamphetamine really uh, has an impact on is one's ability to kind of have normal sex and have normal intimate relations. And so I put that onto a book, culmination of about 15 years worth of work. Methamphetamine increases sexual desire to a great extent. So people become sexually aroused, preoccupied, uh, they're on the internet with pornography, they're acting out, uh, and it turns off the frontal cortex, which means they have poor judgment, uh, they're not predicting bad outcomes, and so people uh, are very horny and they have bad judgment. And so that leads to a lot of high-risk, dangerous sex, unprotected anal intercourse with many partners. It leads to injection drug use, which can also spread the HIV virus. So there's a, a strong correlation between people using methamphetamine and becoming HIV infected. On the other side, of people already who are HIV infected having issues with uh, adherence to their medications. So we see a lot of people because if they use meth, they'll go out for four or five days. They don't eat or drink, let alone take their HIV medications. And so they develop resistance and the drugs start to not be effective and uh, people end up in a lot of trouble. There are several different generations of people living with HIV. I think there's my generation that's a whole different experience what we see today. I have a lot of clients who just think it's inevitable anyway, they're gonna get it, so they might as well just not worry about it and, and it's manageable. Uh, what they don't understand, I think, is that they'll have to take medications the rest of their lives and these medications are toxic. They're, it's basically chemotherapy for life. There's kidney problems, there's cardio problems, there's neuropathy, there are all kinds of complications that go with it. One of the, uh, the ironies of methamphetamine is that um, it increases sexual desire, but it, it causes erectile dysfunction. That's an odd problem for people, they, which they take a lot of erectile dysfunction drugs. You say there's an increase in the amount of anal sex and, and unprotected anal intercourse particularly. Um, and so we not only see people with HIV, they are also almost always have other co-occurring sexually transmitted infections, whether it's syphilis or gonorrhea, chlamydia. It's very dangerous because a lot of them are becoming drug resistant. So we have a, a big problem on our hands. One of the things that we're seeing with, with gay men is a real epidemic of anal cancer. A lot of gay men are not getting um, checked out and getting pap smears and seeing if there's the possibility of anal cancer. And, and it's something that really needs to be addressed. It's really kind of a public health epidemic. It certainly is a major consequence of that kind of activity. That's all based on, on what's called the HPV, the human papillomavirus, which is very common. Something like 60 or 70 percent of people in the United States already have it. Um, and there are many substrains of HPV, but four of them, and there are four common ones, can go on to cause cancer. And so if, if someone has uh, one of those strains, it's very important for them to be monitored. And uh, women get monitored routinely with pap smears. Um, and this, it's really the same process for men. And what that does is to see if there's cells that are starting to transition from healthy normal cells into what's called dysplasia, or then uh, which develop onto cancer. And you can tell fairly easily, um, but there's a lot of problems with it. A lot of insurance companies won't pay for pap smears because they think it's something only for women. A lot of tests aren't calibrated to read it on a man. So you really need a, a astute gay physician who, is, who can do it and is aware of what, what happens. It's important also to, to say, now that there's a vaccine uh, for HPV that is available, uh, it's, it was originally tested for young women. Uh, it's now been approved for gay men as well. And it does protect you against HPV. Uh, but of course, if you're already infected, as many young men already are, it's not gonna be protected. But there's a common belief that it's kind of hopeless out there because it's very uh, common to have people relapse multiple times before they get uh, 
a good abstinence. What we do know that people can recover, there are many people now with many, many years of recovery, and it's a struggle because of the way methamphetamine impacts the brain. Methamphetamine affects the dopamine in the brain. It causes a flood of dopamine which makes us feel euphoric and, and good. The problem is that methamphetamine is toxic to the transmitters that, that carry that dopamine around the brain. And so basically with ongoing meth use, uh, your brain pathways are being destroyed and they take a while to regenerate. So once you stop using meth, and there's brain scans that show this, the dopamine is gone, but the dopamine after a month of sobriety is still gone. After six months, it's still gone. And it takes up to 12 to 18 months for the brain to basically rewire so that it can start distributing that dopamine again. And so during that 18 months, people are depressed. They're feeling hopeless. They're feeling like they are struggling every day not to use, but they're not improving. And so it's, it's a long struggle that really requires um, a lot of group support, and I recommend a lot of individual therapy as well. Methamphetamine is very easily associated with other things. So for example, methamphetamine and sex, uh, it fuse, we call it, it fuses, it comes together, and so you take out the methamphetamine, the sex goes with it. And so when people start to bring sex back into their lives, very often they start thinking about the drug again. So to learn how to have sex without the drug is a big challenge. Methamphetamine is an extremely effective way to just numb any emotion. And so if people um, have strong, uncomfortable feelings, whether it's sadness or grief or shame, those can feel very strong and raw. And it's very tempting for someone, as those feelings start to bubble up again, um, to want to push them down. And so that's why I think therapy is so important to help people understand how to deal with those feelings in a healthy way without wanting to numb them or, or escape from them. The other thing I found, I just say, is just a lot of times I think gay men are just looking for a connection. And oftentimes that's sexual connection, but many times it's just, um, I think as gay men we sometimes feel like the outsider, we don't feel like we belong. And I think um, everyone's kind of struggling for that at some level. And methamphetamine creates that in an artificial sense. The book is really geared at two audiences. One is for the meth user himself, um, and I think a lot of the gay men that I've worked with who use meth don't understand what meth is doing to their bodies and their brains, uh, and how it works, and how it's actually kind of hijacking their sexual desire and kind of transforming it into something that's much more dangerous. And so to, to understand that process is, is half of the book. The, the more important half, I think, is the recovery process, what to expect uh, in terms of the long time frame of recovery, how to deal with emotions, that importance of connection. The other audience is the professional. And I do a lot of training for therapists around the country on methamphetamine and they're hungry for information about how this drug works and what they can do to help their clients get past that. And the book really lays out a formula for them in terms of working with clients, or as I say, for the, for the men themselves. One of the very important factors in a successful recovery is to be in some kind of group setting, to be with other men or women who have similar experiences and can offer mutual support. Ideally, it would be wonderful to have family support as well. Um, one of the consequences of methamphetamine is that uh, people become so self-absorbed and selfish that they very often burn every bridge. So they don't, they don't have a job, they don't have a house, they don't have a partner, their family is disgusted and won't deal with them anymore. I've asked clients, tell me who your support system is, and the only people they can name are their drug dealer and the users that they use with. And that was a lot of beliefs I had, I think, as an HIV positive person. Uh, and the, there's words that I hear echoed a lot with my clients, and then that's my HIV positive clients. They come in saying, I feel like damaged goods. They feel a lot of shame, and there'll never be anyone for them out there. And um, that's just wrong. My first partner died in 2004, um, and I was uh, quite devastated. I been with him my whole adult life practically um, and so uh, I went through my grieving stage and process and uh, was not looking for anyone uh, to meet but about a year later um, I had a date with with a man and uh, we hit it off and we became partners uh, so that was in 2005 and then uh, we got married in 2014 
in Washington, D.C. It wasn't quite legal yet in Florida. It was soon after that. His name is Eddie. He is HIV negative. We've been together long before there was PrEP. We're safe. We take precautions. And he's very healthy. And, and uh, I've remained healthy with my HIV status as well. And so it's, it's worked out quite well. It's honestly not been an issue. Many young men in their early 20s who have become HIV positive and have Hep C, uh, all because of some youthful acting out. And I think 20 or 30 years ago, the consequences might not have been so dire. Uh, but I think with methamphetamine now and all the other things out there, despite the fact that we can control HIV much better, it's still a very high risk. Many want to speak to their parents. They love their parents. They look at their parents as their primary support system, um, but feel that they're going to be shamed or stigmatized or um, accused of some other kind of bad behavior and they don't go there. So um, I would tell parents they may not agree with everything, but I would ask them to not lose sight of the love they have for their children and to be open to at least hearing their kids and being there for them. So people can find more information about my work and the book at my website, which is www.david-fawcett.com.